For MedSchool.com, I'm Dr. Sanjay Sharma, and welcome to If I Knew Then, a show that's based on a very simple premise, that when everything is said and done, life comes down to a few key moments and decisions. On today's show, we're thrilled to have Dr. Rebecca Crusobrink from McMaster University. She's a professor there. She's an expert in global health, and she's also an outstanding concert pianist. So Rebecca, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, let's just start from the beginning. Take me through where you grew up, what it was like growing up, and maybe some of the important influences uh, that you can remember that have, have forged who you are today. Well, thank you for the invitation, first of all. Um, I, I actually grew up in a very small rural farming town in southern Ontario, um, oldest of six girls. Wow. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was a my dad was a very spoiled spoiled guy for, for sure. sure. Um, and I don't remember the first time I thought about going into medicine per se, but it was when I was young, and there were a couple of things. One was I was a voracious reader, and I read an awful lot of autobiographies and biographies of physicians. Um, wow missionary physicians, Africa fascinated me, uh, the story of David Livingston fascinated me. And then when I was eight, um, my mom had a really bad farming accident. But what, what um, the family, myself included, we were all out picking up stones, a pretty, pretty common springtime activity for farmers, actually, because you're getting the fields ready for planting. And there was there was an accident and I remember being at the scene and my mom saying to me you know put pressure here where, where there was obviously bleeding happening and my and my dad uh, getting her to the hospital and that whole experience is you know they say that pivotal experiences are imprinted on your brain that experience and the way I felt that day and sort of the responses that we made to the paramedics when they came by later and what happened in the hospital is imprinted on my memory I'll never forget it and it really brought to light the fact that living in a rural area you just have less access to health care because there are fewer physicians the closest hospital was almost half an hour away so that was, a, that was a bit of a pivotal moment. And I started to say to my parents, you know, I think I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up. And my dad, um, my dad is an amazing guy. He would say, you know, that's great. You know, study really hard. If you decide you don't want to do it, it's okay. But, you know, if you decide you do want to do it, you know, we'll help you. We'll support you. And, and my mom, uh, huge, huge influence as well. So one of the things that I think has also sort of shaped how I got here is the fact that myself and all of my younger sisters were homeschooled. Oh, so, wow. yep. So through elementary and high school, and that gave us a couple of things. Um, one, my closest in age sister was just under a year and a half younger than I was. And she wanted to do everything just as soon as I did. So she was my closest teammate, my fiercest rival, my study buddy from the age of four or five on and we did a lot of our schooling together then there was a bit of an age gap and then the next two was um were a little bit younger but that that experience growing up um being homeschooled really taught us to be self-directed to sort of set your eyes in a goal and go for it if i wanted to be a physician and my my, my parents were extremely supportive of from day one you know whatever science curriculum i wanted to study they made sure i had it you know i remember sitting down and memorizing whole chapters of my grade 10 biology textbook that kind of thing it it also gave us a, a lot of growing up experience, learning to set objectives and meet them, right? So the whole notion, I, I, I did study med school, I studied medicine at McMaster, and the, the, the whole concept of self-directed learning, problem-based learning, um, that was something that was just part of my high school experience because of the fact that I was, was at home, and I never mm -hmm. had a public school experience, so I don't know what that comparison would have been like, but I know I felt really well prepared heading into university and, and, and med school. Um, my mom was our main teacher and it's, and it's interesting because she actually 
wasn't a wasn't a registered teacher per se. She was somebody who I actually think I'm a lot like her in the sense that she had goals, she set objectives, she worked really hard to meet them, my dad too. And they never they never expected us to meet a certain benchmark. They said, you set your goals, but if you're com- going to commit to something, you give it 150%. So that was huge, right? It, it, it really did give all of myself and my sisters a, a, in a sense, control over what we wanted to study, but huge motivation to be the best at it that we could be. But, but that, I mean, that really just sounds like it's an incredible gift that they gave you, right? That, that the concept of it's much more process driven. You know, yeah. it's, it's not about the diplomas, at the, uh, you know, on the, on the wall behind you. You know, it's, it's about, it's, later. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's as much or, or more importantly, it's really about the process and, and what happens and, and making sure that, you know, the process is also coming from within you, right? So, uh, I mean, I, it sounds like you've had an amazing um, opportunity. Now, I just, I, I, I'm interested always in, in people who come from, you know, a bit of a, off of a different path, right? So, I mean, the homeschooling path is is interesting. I'm just sort of, the, I mean, how did your mom set that up? I mean, was it like one day was art and one day was this, or was it completely unstructured? And, and it was like, you know, here's water and here's light and you, you know, you kind of, you kind of navigate around that, you know? I think there's a lot of misperceptions um, about homeschooling in the sense that it, it really is a very large umbrella term that can mean a lot of different things. For some people, it means they do all their courses online through computer um, and internet based sources. And, and it's the same as if you were in a classroom, except it's distance education for us. Um, My mom started curriculum searching, I'm pretty sure, when I was two and (laughs) and mapped out the curriculum that we'd be studying language, language arts, English, writing, science, physics, math, everything was there. I I will, you know, to be honest, I actually never studied French. But (laughs) we didn't, we could have if we had wanted to. In fact, some of my younger sisters actually went on and did study French through a program called Rosetta Stone. So it wasn't that it wasn't available. It's that I was spending all of my time studying biology and writing English essays. So it, it, the curriculum was there. The online or phone tutors were there if we needed them. And for some of the more advanced math stuff, we definitely did. My mom never professed to be the expert in calculus, but we had the resources and we covered that stuff. Um, Our days were actually quite highly structured. So the other piece of all of this is that from the time I was six until the time I finished university, I was studying piano fairly aggressively and fairly competitively. And that included uh, lessons every week that included uh, music theory and music history courses that included um, a lot of exams through the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. Um, So you progress, you know, grade one, two, three, all the way up to 10. And then you get your associate of the Royal Conservatory of Music and both both myself and my sister Rochelle, as well as a number of my other sisters, um, finished all of those courses before we even went to university. So our days were pretty structured. I can remember uh, my sister Rochelle and I shared the same math textbook. So we we kind of set an alarm and see who could get out of bed first, get to the math textbook first. Wow, wow. The piano the piano was in a soundproof room. So, you know, whoever didn't get the math textbook would go to the piano. We're talking like 5.15, 5.30 in the morning, right? Um, no slouches. And uh, my dad actually at one point had to put an addition on the house because he he was he was no slouch either. He would get up at 630, but he didn't want to be woken up by piano playing at 530. So he put an addition on the house to put the piano in soundproof room so that we wouldn't wake him up with our practicing. But we had a pretty structured day. We would we would do our courses. We had we had our desks, we had our books, we had times for everything. We would typically incorporate some um, outdoor activities of some kind in the afternoons, whether it was farm work related or fun times related. We had uh, lessons and classes outside of the house, um, probably 
I would say at least three out of five days a week, whether it was choir practice or we had some church classes growing up. We had piano lessons out of the house. We had our music theory and history classes. So there was there was a lot going on. We were pretty busy kids. Now, now it's interesting. I mean, you have obviously, whether it's the homeschooling or whether it's, you know, something that was driven internally, it seems to me that humanities, uh, you know, music has been a large part of your, your career. And again, that's a little atypical, I think, for the variety, uh, you know, of most people who, who pursue a career in medicine. Um, do, you, do you think, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm always interested in, you know, there's, uh, you know, STEM schools, which are, you know, high-end math and technology schools, and there's, you know, a group of, of people in the educational space who now are talking about STREAM, where they're infusing arts as well into, uh, or humanities based into, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, to balance the scientific or mathematical side. Do you have strong opinions one way or the other? I guess knowing, knowing you know, your own background, how important humanities has been for you personally and for the next generation of physicians is, you know, do you think it should be mandatory that, that there is, you know, art history or, uh, you know, piano or, or filmmaking, um, you know, for, for people who are going into medicine? It's an interesting way to ask the question. Um, I think I think that the two streams, so the humanities and the arts on one side, and sort of the math science techie bits on the other side, they're actually very, very complementary because medicine as a career and as a profession demands both, right? So just trying to think of a good way to phrase this. The process of learning a musical instrument requires the kind of hours, dedication, commitment to a process, commitment to a process which may not see an actual outcome for months. Like when I did my final year of university graduation recital, I was preparing for that for a full year. I didn't get the same ups and downs throughout the year that you'd get with say my physics or biology course where you write your six or your four exams throughout the year you you know you have a chunk of information you're responsible for then you sort of forget that information move on and then come back to it and study for the final so there's it's it's a very parsed out um and laid out course for example um with math you've got formulas with with other science classes, sort of physics, chemistry, they incorporate both. With the arts, you've got a lot more emphasis on process, on creativity, on writing, actually, how to express yourself, um, even communication, how you, how you portray yourself as a person or as a professional to an audience, or in my case, to patients. Um, I think that some way of teaching those skills and the importance of teaching those skills and giving someone a chance to realize how much of a beautiful outcome they can bring is actually really important. And in fact, where I've probably seen in my own career, some of the aspects that bring those two together are when I'm actually talking to patients. Interesting. So, so the the science of medicine is fascinating and we will never ever ever know every single thing that we want to know within the specific field that we have chosen for me internal medicine internal medicine i don't even know the statistics but the number of new papers being published every single minute how is any one person going to keep up with that right there's always going to be more to learn more to know it's fascinating it's lifelong learning it's why i love what i do but the patient in front of you doesn't care about that they only care about the problem that they have they care about the problem um, the symptom that brought them to hospital no matter what the scientific background of it is they care about how you're going to explain it to them they care about how you're going to make them feel better they care about knowing that you've got their back, that sort of thing. 
they care about how you're going to guide them through decision making about a difficult choice or a difficult process, whether it's the patient or the patient's family members that you're talking to. And I honestly feel that going through the arts training that I have, learning how to communicate in that way. And I'm not saying there's not other ways to learn that, but that is one really beautiful way that I see the two being, um, the two working together in, in, in my own day to day, in all honesty, there is other side benefits. Like, you know, I'll walk into a patient's room and they'll say, Hey, your last name. I've seen that before. Are you one of those Crystal Brink sisters that used to do the concerts, you know, out in Elmira? And I'll be like, yeah, sorry, guilty as charged. And immediately you've established some rapport, right? Especially since I'm working in a community where both of my parents actually grew up. So that, that's been a wow. little bit interesting. So there's that as well. But <sighs> training in arts and training in sciences basically doing the two of them trains both sides of your brain and i i only see benefits and i would never say that it should be mandatory because i think everybody needs to pursue what they're passionate about one of my biggest pieces of advice to undergraduate students who want to do medicine and think that there's one magic degree that they think they need to they need to obtain to actually get that golden ticket into medical school. I say, no, there's no one single degree. I said, certainly look at prerequisite courses. That's what I did. But choose an undergraduate degree that you are passionate about, that you will enjoy, because if you enjoy it, you will do well. And choose an undergraduate degree which you feel is going to give you tools to go forward in life, right? Because not everybody who wants to go into med school gets into med school. And not everybody who thinks they want medicine at age 18 actually still wants medicine at age 22. So choose something that will give you a basis to continue to build on that will sort of excite you and, and, and something that you're passionate about so that at the end of your degree, you've got something that you can work with that you're proud of that's given you tools, regardless whether you actually go into medicine after that or not. I think, and that was why for me, I wasn't going to do an undergraduate science degree because my career would have gone, it would have gone a very different direction if I had done music professionally. Um, and I could have, and I could have gone on and gotten a master's, done some music education, performing. My sisters and I did a lot of performing as an ensemble when we were teenagers. And when, even when I was in university, my sister Rochelle and I, uh, she's now an anesthesiologist um, uh, based in Toronto. She and I did uh, two piano concerts, have a CD, like everything. Wow. Um, yeah, we've actually got, my sisters and I have six discs out, I think. The last one we, we recorded 2006, so it's been a while. But you, you could have gone that direction, but I always said I'm going to be better as a full-time physician, part-time musician than the other way around. So <laughs> I, I was lucky. I had the choice. I got into medical school. I was able to get all the way through, but... You know, if I hadn't, I would have had a plan B, as it were, that would have made me really happy and feel fulfilled. And so I think I think that's important um, advice for undergraduates um, who who are looking at I've got the rest of my life. I'm 18 years old. What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's that's critically important. I, I just you know was watching a podcast, uh, interestingly enough, around blockchain technology. Uh, and you know the concept in you know five to seven years, probably seventy million people who are, are going to become unemployed by you know various new technologies. And so, you know the skill sets that you can learn, uh, you know whether it's communication, whether it's uh, you know just so many of the so, so you know quote unquote softer skills uh, that you acquire during your degree, I, I think are going to become incredibly important. And people who are you know more kind of Renaissance trained. In creativity and stuff, I, I think actually, uh, you know, are, are going to do very well. So, um, I was going to use the term Renaissance man, <laughs> Renaissance woman, but you took it. Out of my mouth. <laughs> oh, there you go. Now, now walk me through. Um, so, doing a doing a, a music degree, advantage, disadvantage. Uh, like, was it, you know, was it difficult to get into medical school? Like, was that how, how did people perceive you uh, at the admissions committee level? Well, 
I don't know that um, I can actually speak honestly to how they perceived because I've never asked them, mm -hmm. but I did get in and so did my sister. So, and there's a lot that didn't. I think the emphasis, at least currently in medical school applications is broader than looking at exactly the degree you've done. There's still a lot of emphasis on grade point average. There always probably has to be because they have to have some way of differentiating or cutting off the thousands and thousands of applications that they get. There's an emphasis on GPA. There's an emphasis on your application and your essays and so on. And then if you make it through into the interview phase, every school does it a little bit differently. Um, McMaster, it's evolved over the years, but the, the way they ran their interviews, the multiple mini interview, um, multiple stations, um, examining everything, communication skills, why do you want medicine, how is your degree giving you some tools to help you in medical school, problem solving station where you sit with your back to another student and have to talk, you've both got a map in front of you, there are different mm -hmm. landmarks, different scales, you don't know that. And you have to talk the other person from point A to point B. Quite, quite creative, quite clever. Um, there were interviews like at other schools that were much more traditional in design. But I do think that medical schools, if you have, if you meet a certain academic prowess, I mean, medical school is hard. It's really, really hard. Residency is hard. So they they have to know that you coming in can work hard, can make the grades can meet deadlines, can do all that stuff, right? That's why yeah, I think GPA sure. is still one of the criteria. But beyond that, they want, they want to know that you're going to be a compassionate, you know, well-communicating, honest-to-goodness, real-life person. And I think that's what the different phases of the application process are trying to get at. And in all honesty, I... I don't think we had any advantage or disadvantage coming in with the music degree. And it's, it's um, allowed us to, when I say us, I mean my sister and I, but, but really we did have the chance to take two passions and really run with both of them. And it was wonderful, honestly. We actually were still performing into our first couple of years of med school, but it then it got a little challenging with time, so. <laughs> Now, now, take me through medical school. So you went to McMaster University, um, yeah. and uh, you know, were there were there one or two experiences that you just you know you look back on now and you say, hey, you know, these were really critical things that I went through that have changed me as a person. You know, it could be a patient interaction. It could be you know something that uh, that you were exposed to with your classmates. Is there something that stands out? There are a couple of pivotal moments, I think. Um, and again, you know, coming down to decision making. So a lot of medical students are very stressed about what am I going to apply to? And if you're lucky enough to go into medical school knowing exactly what you want to apply to and not change your mind, no matter which rotations you do, that's actually kind of lucky. That's that that makes everything easier. So I was in a three year program, we don't have a lot of time to make decisions about what we want to pursue for electives, for the matching process for residency, etc. I started medical school coming from a rural area, I thought I was going to be a rural family doctor, um, deliver babies, do emerge shifts, um, maybe do an extra year of training in something like anesthesia or emerge. That's kind of where I thought I was going to be. I really liked the diversity of skills. I was part of the uh, rural medicine interest groups, all that stuff. And it was probably six to eight months into my first year that I shadowed a internal medicine physician on some of her morning um, morning emerge rounds at one of the hospitals in Hamilton. And at that time, that particular hospital wasn't a teaching hospital. So it wasn't teams of senior and junior residents doing the rounds. It was the internists themselves. And I would watch her go from room to room, looking at the admissions from the night before, taking histories, examining patients, making decisions, and doing 
and and making these decisions and figuring out what was wrong and taking next steps based on a vast, vast amount of knowledge and experience. And I was just in awe. So I started to think, you know, internal medicine sounds pretty neat. You know, it's broad. I'd have to know an awful lot. And then I had a chat with my dad about it. He says, Rebecca, you know, I hate to break it to you, but you're kind of klutzy when it comes to all those procedures. You know, you should stick to pushing a pen and thinking and talking. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, dad. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's not entirely wrong, although I think I've proven him wrong a few times, but he knows I do, I do like to sit and think through complex problems and do the problem solving bit and constantly looking for the differentials and so on. So he wasn't wrong there. A year later, I was on elective in a critical care unit, incidentally, in Kitchener-Waterloo at one of the hospitals I work at now. It was my first critical care experience and I spent it working with an absolutely fantastic preceptor who is now one of my colleagues. And it was absolutely pivotal in terms of, wow, critical care is like internal medicine on steroids. I see everything here. I see every internal medicine problem. I see surgical problems. I get to do some procedures. I get to work through the complex medical problems, but I also get to sort of be there when the situation's really tough. I get to be with patients at their lowest and highest moments. I get to help the families through this. Wow. And that two weeks actually made my decision for critical care. And I had ne I have never looked back since I, I, I started my internal medicine residency training. And I basically, by the end of my second rotation, in my first year of residency, um, that that I knew that's what I wanted to do, and I honestly haven't regretted that for a minute since. Um, when you're choosing a specialty, you have to embrace what I call the bread and butter of the specialty, as well as the cool cases, as it were. And there isn't, I don't, I can't think of a single aspect of critical care that I don't enjoy working through and managing even the lifestyle lifestyle is pretty tough but i honestly love it i did have a few naysayers as i was going through my residency because i had a huge interest in global health and global medicine and there was a lot of um well you know if you want to do global health why do you pick something more relevant like you know infectious diseases or something but i thought I thought about it, but then there were two pieces that you needed to consider. One, you need to pursue something you're passionate about doing because at that time, I didn't know where global health and um, global health, the career bit of it for me was going. I didn't know if it would be possible. I didn't know if I'd be working overseas in a volunteer capacity or if I'd actually get some form of you know formal training and so on. I hadn't even thought about Harvard at this point. And the other piece of it was given that you know i didn't really know where the global health piece was going and given that i really did like critical care and if i never went overseas i was going to be really happy staying at home and working in critical care that's where i went so so those were some those were some pretty crucial moments i think in terms of figuring out where i wanted to go and figuring out um really what I loved about what I do now. And when people say, would you change anything about your choice of career, what you're doing? I'm like, I wouldn't change a thing. Not one thing. I love what I do. Now, now you brought up a, you know, kind of an interesting point, uh, the concept of mentors and who you're exposed to in, in medical school and residency. Um, is there, I mean, is there, I mean, I, sometimes I hear, like I literally hear verbatim some of the lines that you know 20 25 years ago that my mentors have told me and i can i can sort of hear them as i echo echo and talk to my kids you know today so out of interest i mean is there are there any just critically important things that your mentors uh have have left you with or is it more kind of more of a, of a global thought i would say both um I would say that one of the things that echoes in my mind over and over again is that you learn something from everyone. So for the senior trainees out there, you know, residents in their third, fourth, even fifth years who are starting to develop their own 
clinical personalities and styles and so on. Every single person that you work with has something to teach you. And once in a while, some of us as attendings, we screw up. And sometimes the thing you learn is what not to do. And some of, sometimes the thing you learn is what to do. So one, that, that is one thing that has really stuck with me. And I, even now, like I'm, I'm, I would call myself a junior faculty member now. I'm still within five, six years of fellowship completion. Actually, it's, yeah, it's just over five years now. Um, time flies. Um, so, so that's one important piece, right? So just remaining humble and realizing you can learn something from everybody that you work with. You learn, you can learn from your residents, you can learn from your attendings, you can learn from your peers. And that, and that is both a global mentorship thing, but it's also something that someone who I really, really respect in critical care in Hamilton has actually said to me and it stuck with me. Um, the concept of, I think one of the, one of the things that I've also learned, and this happened in critical care, one of my critical care mentors is that when you're, this is actually pretty specific. I don't know if it's exactly what you're looking for, but we all, as physicians, we all talk to patients, right? And sometimes you're helping a family member make a really crucial decision about their family member or so on. And one thing I observed and have since really, really, really tried to keep doing myself is don't skip the de to the decision-making part without really learning to understand who the patient is first. And so one, one example that I deal with on a, on a regular basis, this being a critical care doc is code status. And would, would your family member want to go through X, Y, Z resuscitation procedures? And the families will typically stumble a little bit at this because it's an awfully big decision. If you ask, if you ask some physicians, you know, they may not be able to tell you, right? But this particular mentor would say, tell me about your dad. What kind of a guy is he? And, and this particular mentor would always use the present tense. What kind of a guy is he? No matter if he's on four forms of life support or can't talk because he's on a ventilator, what kind of a guy is your dad? What's he like to do? You know, he's at, when he's out in his shop, what does he make? What has he made for you? And really get to know them. And that changes the tone in the room. So that's a pretty specific piece of mentorship, but it really has impacted the way I practice my critical care. Yeah, no, I love that. I, I definitely love that. And, and the concept of really understanding what you're trying to get inside the mind of your patients when you're making decisions is so important. Mm -hmm. When I was training in Philadelphia, uh, you know, we used, to, we used to use a lot of laser for macular degeneration. And, yeah. uh, you know, this one particular person asked us to do the laser, even though there was, you know, a massively high risk of her walking away from the laser, losing vision right away. And it was because she had lost vision in the other eye, you know, and it was, you know, it's, it's, I look back on that and you, and, and I always am reminded how everyone makes decisions in a different yeah, way. The risk, the risk benefit ratio yeah. is very different for every person. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now, now hopping over, uh, obviously, you know, you went to Harvard, you did public health there. Just walk me through the, the the decision-making process around that, because a lot of people, I mean, you had already qualified, you know, you had, uh, you know, you put in whatever, 13, 14 <laughs> years to that point. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I did two master's degree after after becoming a retina specialist. So I remember, you know, the, the, pe the penny pinching days at that time. Uh, but walk me through that decision making process and and where you sit now, you know, six or seven years later, how you feel about it. Oh, my goodness. That's a big question. Let me let me answer it in pieces. Um, <laughs> So as I moved through internal medicine residency, it's three years um, plus an additional minimum one year, usually two of a fellowship, I knew I was going to do critical care. I was fortunate to be chosen as one of the McMaster internal medicine PGY3s to go to Kampala for a one month elective in 2011. And it's one of the high highlights of, I think, the McMaster Internal Medicine Residency Program. And, and I'm so glad that I was able to go because it really did 
it really did change my, my trajectory a little bit. It was my, I had had global health experiences before that. I'd been to Ghana several times. I'd been sort of to rural Ghana, primary care, seeing lots of kids, dealing with infectious diseases, that sort of thing. But this trip to Kampala, to Makere University, Malago Hospital, was one of my first exposures to tertiary level medicine in a low income country. And I came away with a flavor of medicine a flavor of what was being done well in terms of medicine, care delivery, organization, what wasn't being done well, a sense of what might be able to be done about it, and a very strong sense of the commitment and the tenacity of Ugandan physicians to making their country's health care better. A lot of the physicians that I met in 2011 brilliant, brilliant people who had maybe spent six months or three months or one month training outside of their home country, people who could have applied and probably left and who absolutely chose not to because they were committed to seeing things improve in their own country. So that was a really eye-opening experience. And actually, one of the pieces that was most striking for me was not so much all of the cool tropical illnesses that I saw, all those that, although those were definitely there, it was the number of simple, straightforward, critically ill patients that simply couldn't be cared for to standard because of a resource lack. Despite, um, there was a lot of ingenuity on the part of the physicians there, but I saw, I mean, this is, this is, this is kind of sad. I saw a 15 year old postpartum patient die of gram negative bacteremia. Right. I saw a, um, a 32 year old man who was in the ICU with jean Barre syndrome, who was nursed back to health by, um, by the physicians and the critical care nurses, but had a tracheostomy in place, who passed away because they don't have enough suction machines to put on all the floors. And after he'd gone to the floor, his trach blocked. So many little stories, sickle cell anemic patients with pressures of 60 and needing attention, volume resuscitation, maybe transfusion, et cetera, and just not having the resources in the right time to do it. I'm like, these are not high tech problems to solve. Mm -hmm. You need a little bit of monitoring, a little bit of nursing care. And so I came away and, and it wasn't that the physicians there didn't recognize it. They knew that this was a problem. They were doing their level best to let none of this ever um, indicate that I'm I'm coming from a high income country saying we should do it this way. No, that was never that that is never the way I have felt about it. I have always been amazed at what they did with what they had and what they are still doing. It's amazing. But it really prompted me to start looking into what is known about critical illness in low income countries. And voila, uh, here I am in the critical care fellowship that people told me not to do because what's the relationship to global health, right? Um, so I actually, once I matched to critical care, the fellowship program director um, had enough faith in me to give me three months during my fellowship to go back to Kampala. And I spent three months living and working in Kampala. I was at Malago Hospital. We actually... I did a lot of teaching. I did a lot of working in the ICU. I explored some of the other ICUs in the city, the public, private, not-for-profit, private, for-profit, the different models of care that were available. And I looked at ways of quantifying and labeling critical care and critical illness in a city where the norm, normal ways of labeling critical illness weren't available. Normally we say, well, how many ICU beds? How many vented patients? Well, if you don't have the ICU beds and you don't have the vents, how do you label it? And so early warning scores had been sort of a thing in resuscitation literature for a little while already. And that's, I took very simply early warning scores um, and it involves vital signs, it involves respiratory rate, involves O2 SAT, and I got myself together a group of about 20 undergraduate McCary medical students, and we did a cross-sectional survey of all of the admitted ward patients at Malago Hospital over a 72-hour period. I had to get them on a weekend. Um, 
had to make it worth their while, but honestly, they were so, so excited to be part of it and so excited to be helping with a project like this. It took a little while to put it through, you know, the ethics board and all that stuff at McCary University. I had some good help from local collaborators. I brought the equipment with me and the, my goal was to say, okay, this is a measurement that says these patients are critically ill. This is the percentage that we're seeing. And that, and that was actually, um, one one of the outcomes that prompted me down the road to say I need a little bit more education and training and how to run a project, how to get something published, how to design a good survey, how to do qualitative research because the other side of that project, um, apart from the sort of the data collection, was quant qualitative. You know, sitting down with stakeholders, sitting down with critical care providers in Malago and saying, okay, in your opinion, what are some of the barriers to critical care provision here? I got so much rich data. And so after that three months, I came back to um, Hamilton, finished my fellowship, worked very hard on the internal medicine wards as an attending from July to August, and then went to Harvard uh, for that master's of public health. I did leadership courses, I did quality improvement, I did qualitative research I did survey construction it was a course based masters I was just going to get every single bit of tool um, every single thing I could into it what I call the toolkit what do I need to be a more effective leader um, knowledge expert you know in in this developing world of critical care and global health and since that time in the past five years there has been a lot more interest and more publications and I was recently approached by a group um, out of one of the emergency medicine colleges in the states who are trying to put together a consortium of people with this interest put together a white paper on the state of the union in critical care and global health and and so on and so forth so it's becoming much more talked about and I'm I, I really do feel that heading heading to Boston and the networking opportunities and the learning opportunities and learning who else in the field is doing this and what are some of the other skills I need to gain, it's all been instrumental, helpful. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, as I, as I look back on this conversation and, you know, you've obviously done amazing things in the, in the world of art through piano and making CDs. You've gone to medical school. You've had a chance to study at Harvard. You've done a lot of stuff in Africa. If you go back, you know, let's say you're having a conversation with your 25-year-old self. What, what, what advice would you give, at the, you know, having gone through all of this stuff? That wasn't that long. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. 25-year-old. Tw 20, yeah, you could say 20-year-old 20, 20 self. What was I doing then? Okay. Um, I would say it's interesting, and I don't mean this to sound conceited in any way, but I there's actually not a lot that I could or would have changed between then and now. There are, what I would say for sure is that there are a lot of parts of the journey that aren't easy. There are a lot of parts of the journey that require a lot of hard work that can get you down, that can force your energy and enthusiasm away from where you want them to be because it seems like the immediate task list is just insurmountable and I've had lots of those periods where you know I'm, I'm sitting down I'm, I'm a list maker so I'm here I'm making my priorities list for today my priorities list for the week and I'm like God, how how is this even going to happen and you get better at prioritizing and then a month later I'll look back at those task lists and I'll say they got done these ones didn't but I guess they weren't as important right um, so I guess the one piece of advice, one of them would be, it's not going to be easy. It's not meant to be easy. 
but it's worth it. Um, the other piece would be to choose what your priorities are going to be. There are some times during the residency program that you've really just got to put aside research, put aside, you know, I don't know, so a few sort of administrative tasks that you may have taken on as a, as a, as a resident. Not indefinitely, just temporarily, because maybe the clinical rotation that you're on is one of the most insane call schedules you've ever been on. But that's giving you skills that you're going to use as an attending in the future because you've got to be able to manage patient volume. You've got to be able to manage patient acuity. Maybe on another rotation, you don't have that same clinical demand and you can choose to focus your energies on something else. Maybe maybe that's the rotation you will finish your research project on or finish that data collection or finish reading those, you know, papers for your, for, for your review. I would say the third piece is never, ever, ever forget that from the first day of your undergraduate degree to the last day of your residency and master's and PhD, if you've done it, it's not about it's not about getting the degree done. This is now your life. School is your job. Residency is your job. It's a pretty tough job, for sure, because you're responsible for patients. You're responsible for your junior learners. And you're responsible to the university because you're still paying them tuition. But it's your job. It's your way of life. Don't put off everything that's important to you in life until the end of it. I did a little bit of that. Would I change it? I don't know. I, that's a very personal that's a very, per I did defer things. That's not, that's not always something you can really think about at the time. It's not always something you control at the time. But if you have a choice, don't defer everything until afterwards, because no, this is your life now. And this, this part of the job usually occupies us between 18 and 35. And you want to live life between 18 and 35. You don't want to defer everything until after. <laughs> And for everybody, what that includes is going to be something different. Um, I don't know. Does that help? Does that kind of absolutely, absolutely? I, like it's um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. It, uh, I mean, there, there, there's so much there to, to to really think about from your varied background to uh, to your philosophy. But but sitting from my and 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 someone who's maybe a little bit more senior definitely a lot more senior than you uh you know what i can say is uh, you know i'm thrilled to see you know that the next generation of the the younger uh attendings you know people like you who have been exposed to a lot of things who are thinking deeply about life thinking deeply about how they can make an impact not only here in canada at a patient level but at a system level and and import some of the expertise into africa it's uh um, it, um, I, I'm thrilled to have met you, uh, and, uh, and I, I wish you the best, uh, in your career and I'm, I'm sure you're going to hit it out of the park. Thank you. Honestly, it's been a pleasure. I, I love the opportunities we have as junior faculty, senior faculty to mentor and to shape the, the next generation. If there's anything I can do in terms of answering questions from your audience or more specifically there's a lot of different things i've tackled so you know i'm i'm happy to help address some of those great thanks thanks again and thanks everyone for watching this has been if i uh, knew then uh, it's a, a wonderful show where we really get to pick apart some of the decisions uh, that that people who really inspire us in medicine are, have made uh, just remember to subscribe Again, feel free to drop us a line, ask us questions that you want. We're working on uh, three or four more shows coming up in the next uh, few weeks. So we, uh, we definitely welcome your support. Thank you.